Okay, we're all set to go. So today we are going to cover um, the inventory reports. And uh, we do have, when I timed this session, I was hoping that most of the little kinks um, we had on the reports were resolved, um, but our inventory releases have been uh, pushed back a little bit. So, um, so we do still have some things that need to get ironed out in the next two releases. And I will note those as we're going through, um, but let's just say the session is how it's going to look once those um, bug fixes or, or those bugs have been fixed, have been resolved. Um, so that's how we're going to proceed with this session. Um, so, and I, like I said, I will note those issues. They are scheduled for the next two releases. Um, we just released 126 and um, we are releasing 127 as soon as testing is done. And I know that the, uh, the, QA team is testing that right now. Um, so we don't have like a specific time schedule of when um, that release will go out. You know, we were shooting for every two weeks and that really hasn't happened, but we're trying to get back onto that schedule. Um, so uh, it, it, hopefully that 127, I'm hoping will be out sometime the next week. Um, and then they're going to focus on uh, 128 because a lot of those issues are finished. It's just that we need them to be tested. So the Q18 um, will be looking into those as well. Um, so yeah, so we've got a lot, um, a lot of uh, things that we're working on. A lot of not just bug um, fixes, but also some enhancements on the reports, especially the book value. I know that's a big one with the auditors not being able to sort by function, that seems to be the biggest uh, response that we're getting right now. So um, those will be out there as well here on these next couple of releases and getting those resolved. So what I've done is, and I don't have this posted out there yet on our registration page, but I have um, documented <clears throat> um, just discussing what, how these reports are being, um, the data is being pulled into these reports. And I wanna give you um, that information because it helps you to understand, especially um, you that are new to inventory in general, you didn't have any classic experience. So you didn't understand the classic reports to begin with. Um, so that's why I wanted to, to kind of dig deeper into these reports to explain to you where these amounts are coming from. Now, with that being said, we do have some, like I said, some issues out there that need to be fixed. Um, and so we are, like I said, working on those. Um, and I will address those while we're in here, but at least this will help you to kind of understand where things are, or where they're going to be once those AGIR issues have been released. So I'm gonna focus on the gap reports first. And then we're going to go in and discuss um, a couple of the non-GAAP reports, like the book value. I'm not going to go into the brief asset listing and stuff like that. Those are pretty self-explanatory. Um, but I did want to talk about the book value and also um, just the newly released ones, those fiscal year-end uh, related reports. I thought I'd touch upon those and the audit report. And then after that, I've got some kind of Q&A um that uh i want to um talk about like when you're you know closing a period but the prior period still current how is that reflected on the reports stuff like that so those faqs are going to be in there as well um and i am still tweaking this document that i have here so that's why i haven't put it out there on the registration page so um, once, and I will tweak it again after those bug issues have been released and it's been fixed so that I can get rid of some of the notation in here. Um, so this is kind of a work in pro progress type of um, document, but I feel like it will be helpful for those of you that are new uh, to the reports in inventory in general. Okay, so this first one here, um, 
It is the fixed asset by source report. So I'm going to jump over to, you know, where these are at. All the gap reports are underneath their own subsection um, in the application. So the fixed asset by source, for those of you that did know Classic, that is the EIS 101 report. And so when it says by source, that's, a, uh, that's the, the, the red flag right there, that this is looking at where it was purchased from. Now, I'm just going to go into like a specific item here. And I'll just pick on this one here. And so when I look at this item and I've got the fund and function and asset class pulled up here, <clears throat> the fund is the fund that it's where it's currently being used. So this is a John Deere tractor. Um, so it's being used, it's part of like the general fund in the 2700 function code, which is um, maintenance. And so, and also it's considered a fixture furniture and equipment. Um, it's not considered a vehicle in this type of situation. So it's the 0300 asset class. So even though it's being used in the general fund, it may not have been purchased from the general fund. Maybe it was purchased out of a different um, account on the PO. That information is stored underneath the acquisition. And so I've got a couple of acquisition records on here. And so there could be multiple acquisitions um, against an item. So there could have been, you know, when the item was uh, purchased on the PO, it was, you know, the same, maybe the same account but it was all supposed to be underneath the same tag. So they added all three items on that PO underneath that one tag. So when you look at it underneath the items window, there's one tag, but when you go into the acquisition window, there's three acquisitions against it. Um, and so, like I said, each of those could be the same account. They could be different accounts. Um, so it just depends, number one, on how they entered them especially in classic, um, that makes a big difference because if they went in and entered them in manually through like pending items and pulled it in, it all would have been recorded. All of those account codes related to that PO would have been recorded and you would see all the complete acquisition information. If they went in and imported a bunch of items, a bunch of laptops, um, when they import, and it, it works the same in classic and redesign, when you're doing the import like that, you can't pull in, you can't import the acquisition information at the same time you're importing the items. It will create the acquisition and, it'll, and it will record the amount and the date and the tag number, but all this extra purchase order information, account codes, that is not automatically imported in you would have to do a second import in redesign in order to get that information in. In classic, it was difficult to do that. Um, you would have to go in and manually add that information. And so a lot of that then isn't showing up and when it migrates you know, or isn't being recorded. Um, so when you migrate over, you're going to see acquisitions like this one right here. I'm gonna go ahead and view this one. And you're just gonna see, like I said, the tag, the type defaults to acquisition unless it's changed, um, but that's usually the default acquisition type, the date and the amount. The rest of this information does not get pulled in when you're importing. So like I said, when you're doing a manually, absolutely. If you're pulling it from the pending file and it's got all this information in there, great. Then all of the account code that it was purchased from the source fund, what that's called, um, that will be displayed in here, the PO information, the check information. This information over here gets populated when the item is added. So when I add, imported that item or added the item manually through here, um, 
it's going to pull that information from the item record and display it in the acquisition record. So in this type of situation, there was no account code tied to this acquisition. Um, so this is what um, is, you know, right now causing uh, some issues um, on the fixed asset by fund source and redesign because we broke something on the 126 release that we fixed on the hot fix, um, 126.1. But right now, these type of situations where we have um, this type of acquisition where it's blank, um, and I'll explain this here in this document in more detail, but it may be showing these these um, amounts here underneath an invalid fund on the fixed asset report. And we have had tickets from people wondering where that invalid is coming from. So I've had discussions with the developers about this because I'm like, this isn't how it behaved in classic. Mind you, the report amounts balance, but they don't like to see that invalid. And I agree with them. Um, we need to improve it so that it mimics how classic showed this. And so that's the first thing I want to go through with you guys is how it's currently working on the fixed asset by source report and how it will be working once we get those um, invalid funds taken care of. Okay, so let's get really into the heart of where these amounts are coming from. And like I said, the fixed asset by source is starting with the source fund, which is this guy right here, this fund dimension. So if it's filled in, great. It's going to reflect one way. If it's not filled in, meaning it's blank or all zeros, then it's going to behave a different way. And so let's talk about all of those different scenarios here. Okay. So um, what I have is I have a screenshot of that acquisition record that we were just looking at. And then I have um, a screenshot of the fund option underneath core funds, and then a screenshot of the fixed asset by source report. And so right now, before we go into um, in, uh, JIRA issue 408, this is how this report is currently behaving. So, if the fund dimension right here is blank on a capitalized acquisition record, or look, that's what we're looking at, the amount of the acquisition is going to be displayed as invalid on the fixed asset by source report, okay? So right now, let's take a look and see how this is happening. So right now, my account code fund source is empty. It doesn't, it can't tell me where it came from. It can tell me, and this was added this year, it can tell me that the related fund on the item record was the general fund. So right now, it's going and saying, okay, it's considered invalid, but where should I still put it on the report? It goes and looks at that related asset fund. This is the account code fund. This is the items asset fund. It looks at this, goes to the fund underneath core, sees that the 001 fund is there and that it's underneath the governmental, it's tied to the governmental fund type. So when it comes time for the report to generate, it's going to go out there and currently, it's like I said, it's showing invalid, but it's listing that amount underneath the governmental fund type section of the report. So question is, oh, how do I know where, you know, that it's, you know, how do I know what invalid is um, or what tag is making up that invalid amount? You could go in to the items grid and query that amount, as well as filter for a blank or zeros account code. And it will probably bring up a handful, hopefully, of acquisitions in there. And then from there with their tag numbers, and from there you could look at those tags underneath the item grid 
and see if they're capitalized or not. Um, unfortunately, there's not a way to do that on the acquisition grid. You have to go to the item grid and, you know, and if they're active, remember the fixed asset by source, all the gap reports are active items. Um, they don't, you know, they don't have the disposed of assets on there. They're active items that meet the capitalization threshold. Um, and so that's one way to go in then. If so when you're going into the item record and you're looking at those and you see that, you know, five out of the six are non-capitalized, well, then you got your tag. You know which one it is. And in this case, it was this particular tag. All the rest that I queried, the other nine, um, were all non-cap items or disposed of assets. Um, so this was the culprit. And this is this tag is making up this invalid amount on the report. Now we're going to try, like I say, and improve this somewhat, or we're going to improve it to what the way classic behaved. Um, so again, currently right now, if this is blank, um, then it's going to show as invalid based on, and then it's going to place it in this governmental fund type section because of the asset fund. Now, if the fund dimension is populated, um, so let's say it is um, 001, um, or let's say it is 010. Let's say the fund number here is 010, but it does not exist. That 010 fund number does not exist in core funds. The amount of the acquisition is still displayed as invalid, um, but it's um, not exist in core funds. The amount of the acquisition is displayed invalid on the fixed asset report. And what it's going to do is because the um, fund code is 010, if it's still underneath, if it's not listed in core funds, the 010 fund, it's still going to look at the fund asset fund and still place it underneath the governmental fund type for that because of the 001 asset fund. So if you have an item that doesn't have an acquisition record at all to it. And it very well happened in classic and those did migrate over that way. Um, so you did have items that didn't have related acquisition record. Those always appear underneath the acquisitions prior to system startup. So that's how that behaves. And if the asset fund is missing, um, then what happens is, so let's say I do have some type of, you know, account code dimension, but the asset fund is missing and this fund code is not on the fund record either, then it's going to get listed underneath the unknown fund type section on the report. It doesn't know where to put it, so it's going to put it there. So that's how it currently works. So I don't want you guys to get locked in on this because it's going to change. We're going to tweak it so it's better, so it mimics how classic is working. And the issue that's going to do this is INV 408. And the developers know that we need to get this out sooner rather than later. So I don't think there is a um, scheduled date yet, a release date yet, but they're, they are very aware of this and get this um, taken care of soon. So like I said, we are going to improve this report and get rid of those invalid fund types. That's what we're trying to do and put them in the right spot. Um, so these next two pages list how it will work after 408, the JIRA is, uh, issue is released. So this is what you need to focus on um, so that when you do do training, um, you know, if they're asking about, you know, where these amounts are coming from, from the fixed asset, you can go off of this. Um, so this is how I understand it. Um, obviously, once this is released, if things change, I will update this document so that, you know, kind of consider this, the, you know, the official document on how to, and obviously we're going to um, 
included on the gap report documentation. I feel like that was just, we've had documentation in classic, but it just never really spelled it out completely. So we're gonna take care of that and make sure that it is spelled out in detail, especially this first report, because it's looking at the acquisition records. The other gap reports are, mainly focused on the item information, but this one is, is looking at the acquisition uh, records. So it does get a bit tricky. Okay, so I've got my scenarios. Um, any advice we should give districts who are being pressured by their GAP accountants for fiscal year 22 reports? Um, I mean, this is what this this um, session is for, um, Larry. It's, you know, to explain this um, and you know provide the details as to what's you know what we're currently working on um, and it just you know if they see that invalid amount um, then they need to you know kind of a, say you know right now it's because the acquisition record is blank on some capitalized assets so it's that's where it's coming from before it's, it was in, in the acquisition prior to system startup is where it was at classic. Um, so like I said, we just want to get that back to where it should be. Um, I know that, you know, I know Larry, that you have a, a certain ticket that we're working on as well uh, for one of your districts. Um, so that I, might be a whole nother ball of wax. So um, that's something that I'm having the developers look into to see what's going on with that. Okay, so let's get back to this and how this is going to work. So it just depends on how the acquisition record's looking. Now, hopefully in redesign, you know, obviously when they're entering these in through the items, you know, at the menu and creating an item um, and pulling it through pending file, all of this is already all filled in and it all displays in the proper areas on the fixed asset by source report. Now, if they're going in and importing a bunch of items through the system import option, it's gonna work like it did in classic. I mean, that's not any different. There's more flexibility. So if they're gonna go in and create an item spreadsheet with all of their laptops, um, it will create the related acquisition record, but it's going to have just those specific amount or the amount, the date, and the tag number. It's not going to include all that purchase order information and the account code. Um, so if they want that information in there, um, at least redesign has the capability to extract those acquisitions out of there after the item import has been completed. So if they import those items and they go in to the acquisition grid and filter on those items they just added, they can extract those out into a spreadsheet. And then if they've got like a spreadsheet of the purchase order information, a separate one, they can copy and paste that stuff into the acquisition spreadsheet and then go back in and mass update those existing acquisitions with that information. Couldn't do that in Classic. So they have that capability of doing that now, but it is a two-step process. Enter in the items, and then if they really want this information in there, then they're going to have to add it in there separately by updating those exist existing um, acquisitions. Okay, so how will this work after 408 is fixed? So right now, if they have an item, maybe I this a little bit larger here. Okay. So if the fund dimension, so I'm looking at the acquisition record again. If the fund dimension is blank, it will reference the item's asset fund and the fund type of that and include the amount in the acquisition prior to system startup under that particular fund type section of the report. That's how it's working in Classic right now. So here's my example. Here is my acquisition. This is from a capitalized asset, blank or all zeros account code. So 
doesn't know what to do. So it's looking then at the asset fund and underneath core funds, that's governmental. And so it's going to take that amount and include it under the acquisition prior to system startup amount on the fixed asset by source. So that invalid is, is gone. Now that $1,000 has been moved into the acquisition prior to system startup. So you're not going to see any balancing differences. The, total, the grand total is still going to be the same. It's just in a different spot. It's no longer in underneath that invalid um, fund. It's included in the acquisition prior to system startup. So that's scenario number one. If, I'm gonna go to the next one here. If the acquisitions fund dimension of the account is blank and the asset fund is blank as well, because yes, those were brought over that way, the, the, the classic allowed that, it will include the amount under the acquisition prior to system startup, but because the fund is not identified the asset fund, it's going to include it underneath the unknown fund type section of the report. So, and that mimics what Classic is doing. So again, you're not gonna see invalid in $1,000. You're going underneath the unknown fund type. You're going to see it included underneath the acquisition part of system startup. Okay, next scenario. So let's say that fund dimension does have, um, you know, an actual fund code in there. Um, and that fund dimension is also listed underneath core funds. What happens then is it will display that fund dimension with its core fund description in whatever uh, fund type that that fund is, is listed under, underneath core funds. So in this example, it was purchased with the ONO. Um, this also fund is listed in here in core funds and it's called project fund. So when you generate the report and it's under the governmental fund type. So when you generate the report, it's going to be listed under the governmental fund type section with the description from core funds and the amount. So our last scenario, and I even checked with the developer to make sure that I covered all of them and I miss any. He goes, I don't think you did, but you never know. The last one is what if the account code has a valid fund, O10, but the fund dimension is not listed in core funds. What it's going to do then is look to the asset fund and it's 001. And when I look underneath core funds, 001's under governmental. So what it's going to do, it's gonna look a little different on the report. It's going to report the fund code dimension on the report here with the amount underneath the governmental fund type. So that's, how it's going to behave once 408 is out. Right now, it's showing it, but it's showing it as valid in these scenarios. Um, or, you know, it's, it's, or it's showing it like some of these where they are filled in, it's probably showing it this normally, you know, the same way. Um, but um, it's just when these, you know, blank accounts are showing up and it's not quite sure what to do with it, we want to change that invalid, basically, for it to show underneath the acquisition prior to system startup, which is, like I said, how it's working in Classic right now and how the auditors are used to seeing it as well. Um, one thing I want to make note of, too, with um, the 408, another thing that we are going to do, and I think I have it noted up here, also included on 408 is we're going to allow the ability to edit the account code um, on the acquisition record 
regardless of the acquisition date. Right now, you can edit it if you created that acquisition in the in an open period. But um, we did more testing and classic and found that you can change the account code regardless of when it was entered. You could change the account code if it was all blanks on an asset that was, you know, entered 20 years ago, you can go in and do that. Um, so if, you know, they, if there's a situation where they do want to bring those, where the source fund, source code, where it was purchased from, they do want to update those account codes, they can do that. Obviously, they can't go in and make changes to the fund. These three are always going to be tied to the item record. They'll never be able to modify these in the acquisition record. So this is always, um, these are always going to be grayed out. So I know, and that's why I'm going to put that document out there because I know this is just a lot to take in. And really, I wanted to start with the 101 because it is the most difficult and because we've got um, an issue here to improve it. Um, so for those of you that have districts coming in and saying, I don't know what these invalid types mean. You know, what is this for? This wasn't here before. We understand we put those on there because we were trying to fix something we broke on the 126.1. We tried to fix it and they don't like the invalids. So now we're going to fix it on that JIRA issue um, so that it mimics what they had in classic. That's basically what's going on with the 101. And it took me a whole half hour to explain that. I am so sorry. Any questions? <laughs> Okay, I know that's a lot to process, but I wanted to explain it and you can read this over and over again um, once I get it out there for you um, for it to make better sense. But I felt like the screenshots helped, hopefully, to have those. Okay. So running the fixed asset um, by source report, there's nothing to it. I mean, you're just going in and you can include or exclude entity IDs. So if some of you are like, what are those again? Um, where those are stored is on the item record. And so when you go into the item record, I'm just gonna pull it up here. There's an entity ID field in here. And um, they usually use these in cases where they have a lot of like, let's say um, desks and they have 50 of them. And so the lot, if you combine it all together, which is how they're purchasing it, you know, they're purchasing it on the purchase order as one lot, one group. Um, they're pulling it in and it, it's exceeding their capitalization threshold because, you know, 50 deaths is, let's say $50,000. Um, if they um, do not want those included on their gap schedules because it's inflating it, because really, if you split those, but they don't want to split them into separate tags, um, if they split them, they would be underneath the threshold amount and no longer be considered capitalized. But they don't want to split them out. They want to keep it on the system as in, in a group, in a lot. But they want to somehow exclude those from the gap schedules so they're not included um, in their capitalized assets. What they can do is enter in an entity ID. And this is whatever they want it to be. I've seen non-gap, no gap, exclude. I've seen different words in there. But um, they want to be consistent, though, obviously. They don't want to have five different entity IDs they're using. Um, so they're wanting to exclude lots from their gap schedules. Um, then they're going to have to, they should be using the same thing, I would think. Um, so if they say no gap here, then what happens then is when they go in to run this report, they can exclude no gap. And then those lots will not be included on the gap reports, those amounts from those lots. So that $50,000 will not be included because like I said, if I broke it down and split them all out, the whole lot would be under the threshold. So that's what that, Exclude it, um, and there's also an include and TID, um, and it's on there for not just the gap reports. There's some other non-gap reports too that have these fields. 
And so then we've got the show report option here. And when you generate it, here is my fixed asset by source. And like I said, all of these gap reports have the different fund type sections. They'll be fiduciary, governmental, proprietary, and the unknown, which was what we talked about here in that one scenario. There's no fund out there or the fund type is not listed on the fund code underneath core funds. It's gonna show up in this unknown section. Um, and so all of the gap reports are broken down the same way. So these are totally based on core funds and what they have listed as their fund types. So those should be filled in, they shouldn't be blank. And if they are, they need to fix that. Um, so it's just one of the, unfortunately, many things that was kind of left unnoticed in Classic. Um, and so those um, need to be cleaned up. Okay. So like I said, here's my invalid, perfect example of that one I was just telling you guys about. So like I said, once that issue gets cleaned up, that is going to probably show underneath my acquisition prior to system startup, unless I go in and actually change that account code on that acquisition to its source fund where it was purchased from. Okay. Gonna move on to the next report. The next gap report is a fixed asset by function class. And again, this report includes active capitalized assets and all of these exclude operating leases. Um, when you look at an item on the last section there, um, it has the lease information. If this item is a lease, is it a capital lease or is it an operating lease? So capital lease get included on the reports, oper operating leases do not. Um, with the fixed asset by function class, there are three ways to run this report. And again, that was something that we asked. I mean, we still still requiring these three different ways. And we were told, yes, keep those, you know, make sure that those are available and redesign as well. It's just the, the really the big difference between these three is just how they're sorted. Um, and so when you look at the fixed asset by fund option here, or fixed asset by function class. Here are report types, schedule by function class, schedule by class, and summary by function class. Those are the three. Um, and so if I go back, the schedule by function and class and the schedule by class, the first two that were listed, include the original cost amounts and the book value. So, the difference between these two is that the schedule class sorts it by asset class for each fund type. Whereas, so that's pretty clean. It's just sorting it by asset class for fiduciary funds, proprietary funds, governmental funds, and unknown. Um, the schedule by function in class sorts it by function. And then within each function, by its class. So it's going to show 1100 function and then subtold underneath there 001 asset class, 002 asset class, 003, 004, and then the total. So it does break it down. So <clears throat> that's, I mean, the total should be the same. If you're going in and running a schedule by function class and then running a schedule by class, your grand total amount should be the same. It's reporting the same data. It's just being sorted differently. So <clears throat> um, I'm not going to, you know, time's sake, I'm not going to run through each of the reports. You'll be able to see it, you know, when you're running them. I think I just ran the fixed asset by function, the first one. And here is where I'm saying, you know, here's the function. And then here are the asset classes. It's broken down and then giving the total. So it does look differently on the redesign report versus the classic report. So when you're trying to balance the two, you do just kind of have to, you know, find those totals by function and just make sure that those balance and stuff. Um, but yeah, it is a little bit different. Um, but again, it's got this, it should, they should balance, have the same amounts. 
Um, the third report is a summary by function and class. So in this one, it's not showing the uh, book value. So the first two are showing the book value. The third option is not. This is going to sort by function categorize, categorized by asset classes. So when you look at this report, it's still sorting it by function, but all the asset class categories are spread out at the top. They're columns on the report. Um, this report also allows you to summarize by the first two digits of the function. So if you've got, you know, when you think about like 1100 function code, you could have 1110, 1111, 1112, 1120. I mean, you can have a lot. <clears throat> so if you want to break that down or, or summarize that, so it's just showing the first two digits, then you can use this report to do that. Um, I'm sorry. I have to back up there. I told you that it did not include the book value. It allows you to select whether you want original cost or book value. So the first two reports showed both, but because there's so much on this summary by function and class, because of all the asset classes, um, column showing us columns on the report, um, it doesn't have the room to include both the book value and the original cost. So you have to make you have to select it. Do I want to generate this by original cost? You can do that. And then you can go back in and generate it again underneath book value. Um, and again, this report should match the other two. Those totals should all agree with one another. Um, you will see a couple things underneath here, invalid function or invalid fund. Um, you may see those on the report. And those mean that the associated code is not located underneath the core menus, whether it's the function or the asset class. And unclassified means that the original cost amounts, uh, uh, or they contain original cost amounts where that asset class or function code is missing on the item. So if you know it's trying to pull from the item record here, if it doesn't have a fund um, or a function or an asset class, it's going to show as unclassified. Um, on the report. So those are things, and if that's something they want to fix, they can go in and do a transfer transaction and change that from a blank function code to the function code it should be. And once they do that, they can go back in this and run this report, and it's going to be in that proper function code. So if it's missing both the function and the asset class, they can create transfer transactions to fix them. So if they're going in you know, and this is all stuff that's probably pulled in from classic, you know, um, they've got these blank ones when they're in redesign, they can't create an item if it doesn't have a fun function asset class. Those are, if they're on gap, those are required fields. So, um, and anyone that are trying to do a uh, import spreadsheet, those should be filled in as well. So um, you should get a warning or an error saying that they can't because it's missing a fund. So, um, or a function or an asset class. So hopefully this is from here going forward in redesign, this isn't an issue so much. And you know, this was all part of the pre-data extract steps. They could have gone in and cleaned up these if they wanted to. And I know a lot of them either didn't want to or they didn't have time. Um, you know, and they were fine with it because it's been audited this way for years. So um, migrated over to classic this way. Um, and that's fine. And that's why we let it, it do that. Um, but, um, you know, if there's something that they want to clean up, they can. They can still go into redesign and clean some of these things up if they want to. But I just want to make this known that this isn't a migration problem. This is something that existed in classic and the auditors need to know that. So if they're saying, why isn't there a function code, you know, tied to this item, but why didn't it, why wasn't uh, the function code in classic either? And why wasn't that noticed before? And now it is probably because it's easier to see and redesign because of the grids where in classic, it may not have been as easy because everything was just on a screen. So that's something that, you know, we need to remind the districts of that we had this in classic too, and it was never an issue until now. So why? So um, that's just, I've, I've noticed that on some tickets. So just wanna make sure that 
you know, the auditor is aware of that as well. If, if it's something where it's a bug, we're the first ones to admit it and we'll get it taken care of. But if it was something that existed in Classic for years, then they need to kind of look to see, okay, it was like that. It's like that in Redesign now. Is there a way to clean it up? Absolutely. So, okay, any questions about the fixed asset um, by function and class? <clears throat> now, the next two are going to be the change schedules. If you're like, what does change schedule mean? If you, you know, heard us say that before or the auditors are asking about it. Um, the change schedule means the changes that have been made in capitalized assets throughout the year. And in classic, it was the 103 and the 104 reports. So in redesign, we made them the proper names, <laughs> schedule of changed and fixed assets and schedule of change and depreciation. And so I've got a schedule of changed and fixed assets here. Here we go. I did the summary. Um, so I'll just, sorry, I'll backtrack real quick here. And when I go to reports and the fixed assets, here are the ways that you can run the report. You can run it by fund. And what it does is it go out, goes out there and generates a report by all the fund codes um, that are stored underneath core funds that are tied to items that have an asset fund. Um, or you can also sort it by function. And that would be the assets function or the asset class. Um, asset class is just usually out of the three, there aren't as many asset classes. So I always run the report by asset class just because it's easier to look at. Um, but obviously they want to run it all three ways, make sure that you know everything's good. Um, and the auditors want that too. They want to see them all three ways. Um, and our report bundle also generates them all three ways. So the summary, when you click on summary, it shows you what I just popped up real quick, the summary schedule. And it's I love that report because it shows you exactly what's happened throughout the year. The detail report, if you leave this unchecked, it's going to show you the, the tag items that make up those changes that were made throughout the year. So if I go back to the summary report and I have mine by class, by asset class, um, here's what's happening. So it's going to you know, provide the asset class, the description of that. And then what it's doing, it's going out there and looking at all of those capitalized assets that were capitalized at the beginning of the year. So these are, you know, if I'm running this for fiscal year 22, it's going to bring up everything that's active that has been added since the beginning of time that's still considered capitalized and active and displays that amount, includes that amount in this column. So this is not just stuff that's been added in fiscal year 22. This is everything up to fiscal year 22, not including 22. Any capitalized assets where you made changes, like did a transfer transaction, did an adjustment, added an item or disposed of, are going to show up in the rest of these columns. This is the schedule of change. This is the changes. These are the transaction columns. So I guess you could think of it that way. Beginning value is what we're, you know, for land, I have $656,000 worth of assets at the beginning of fiscal year 22. And then this year I acquired some land that would show up underneath the acquisition amount or I disposed of, uh, you know, sold some. So I created a disposition transaction that would show up here. I, you know, had it as land when it really should have been building. So I'm going to transfer it. So if I create a transfer transaction, that amount of that tag, um, the transfer out will be displayed here. And then on my O2 building, the transfer in will be displayed here. And then adjustments. Now, I want to talk about adjustments because that's the next big thing that I want to explain to you because we are working on some your issues regarding adjustments. Now, the easy easiest thing to remember about adjustments is let's say they notice like that transfer example that 
it should have been an O200 asset class five years ago, and it wasn't. Um, and so they don't, they want to create the transfer transaction, but they don't want it to show as a true transfer in fiscal year 22, because this should have been done five years ago. So when they create that transfer transaction, you'll see when you create one, there is an error adjustment box, checkbox. Um, when they're creating the transfer, when they check that, then what's going to happen is that amount is going to show underneath the adjustments column. So same thing. If I um, disposed of, um, let's say something in the fixtures, furniture, and equipment asset class, and yeah, we should have disposed of that five years ago. Again, you can go in and when you post that disposition transaction, that error adjustment box is there. And when, I think it might just be called adjustment. Uh, when you check that, then that amount is not going to show under the disposition column, that amount's gonna be included in the adjustment column. So by check marking that box, that's one way that adjustments will appear on the schedule change by fixed assets or the schedule change in depreciation. Now, there are a couple others too, and I wanna bring those to your attention. So, and I made note of them in here, so we're aware of that. So I explained the first bullet, adjustment amounts due to an error adjustment that was checked. Now we do have um, a couple things that aren't working. Um, they're putting things in the wrong column right now um, and we are correcting it. And it is on um, JIRA issue 348. It's gonna be on the 128 release. So just a couple, you know, the next release after 127, so not too far away. So, and this has to do with changing the capitalization on an item. So if you are increasing the capitalization criteria, okay? So uh, for items that are no longer capitalized, so they're going in and running the cap criteria option, okay? Um, and they're increasing it. So they're making it from 1,000 to 5,000 you're gonna have a lot of items that are no longer going to be capitalized. So right now they're not showing up correctly, um, but on the 128 release, those amounts for those now considered non-capitalized assets are going to appear as negative amounts on the adjustment column. And here's my example. I have an existing capitalized asset, $1,500, um, I'm sorry, when I say increasing their capitalization, um, in this particular example, um, they increased the, val the value um, of, uh, or they decreased the value of an asset so that it's no longer capitalized. They did a negative acquisition. So in this particular um, example, their cap item was $1,500. Um, and what they did is they went in and entered a negative acquisition uh, for 500. So now this item is no longer considered capitalized. Um, so what happens then is after this 128 release, the $500 is going to appear in the um, acquisition field and the negative thousand dollars is going to appear in the adjustment. So it was capitalized. So it was included in the beginning balance amount. Well, I went in and created an acquisition, a negative one. And when I posted that acquisition, that item is no longer capitalized. So how is that gonna show up on the reports? that's where it's gonna record it properly. And it's going to take the $500 because that was done this year. And it's gonna display it as a negative underneath the acquisition column. But the $1,000, where's that going? That is going to appear in the adjustments. So it's gonna appear underneath the adjustments, the negative $1,000. And that is, 
after the 128 release. Now, if you're decreasing the capitalization criteria, you had it 5,000 and you know, and now you have it 1,000. Um, obviously then there's gonna be items now considered um, to be capitalized. So those amounts will be included in the beginning balance column. And that's why I put note to audit because this behaved not anything differently than it did in classic. So if they go in and, de and so in, in this example here, if I have an existing item for $1,000, not capitalized, uh, but the additional acquisition added for $500, thus making it uh, capitalized, um, the $1,000 is going to appear in that beginning balance column. The 500, obviously, because I did that this year, will appear in the acquisition column, both as positives, obviously. So again, um, that is um, going to change your beginning balance. So they need to, re so their ending balances from the prior year reports will no longer match the beginning balances. Um, and so, you know, we, we've always, um, told districts, you know, when this happened to document this stuff, to be mindful of it, because the auditors are going to look at those beginning balances versus the ending, and they're going to see those differences. I know we have another issue out there, and I will talk about that here in a little bit, uh, regarding um, some beginning balance differences between reports that are run in, you know, fiscal year 21, let's say, and redesign, and fiscal year 22. Um, and we have a JIRA issue to fix those as well. But in this case, um, when you're going and increasing, um, right now it's not showing correctly. I think it might be showing on the beginning balance instead of the adjustments. So the 128 is going to fix this. But for those that are decreasing um, or the items no longer considered capitalized, that amount then is going to be reflective in the beginning balance. So we just need to be mindful of that. Um, and that's that's really the three that I'm aware of right now, the three ways that amounts appear on the adjustment column. And so like this one is not so much part of the adjustment column, but I wanted this bullet but I wanted to bring it to your attention um, because of the changes in the beginning balance on this one. Okay. And I will be tweaking those a little bit more if you're like, um, so increasing does not impact beginning balance, but reducing does correct, Heidi, yes. So. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of what I want you guys to take away from that. And like I said, I'll make sure that that's documented in the report section and as an FAQ too, so that districts are aware of that stuff. So we do have still a lot of stuff to add to the documentation. So that stuff will be out there. And if you're not sure, create a ticket and we'll help you. But what I have on here, once I tweak it a little bit more, is going to be out there in the documentation too. Um, the detail report provides, that, like I said, the tags and amounts that make up those amounts in here. So obviously we're not gonna have tags for this first column, but can't. I mean, that's every um, item, capitalized item that's within the asset class um, from the beginning of time that's still active. Um, that's what this amount includes. But if you're wondering, you know, if they're wondering what makes up the acquisition amounts for the O200, run a detail report and it will show you the tags that make up the 29,000. Um, so that's, that's why those two go hand in hand. Um, so it's basically the detail report is showing what's going on in these sections right here, not the first and obviously not the last column. Everything in between is on that detail report. Schedule a change in depreciation. 
Um, so basically, it's um, the 103, I'm sorry, the schedule change in fixed assets, you're going to catch me saying that, um, is the original cost amounts. So those amounts should match the other two gap reports, the fixed asset by source and, this, uh, and the um, function asset class reports. Those are all original costs, except for, you know, the book value on um, the 102 report. Um, the schedule of change in depreciation is a replacement for the 104 in Classic. This is the depreciation, not the original cost. So here we're just talking strictly the depreciated amounts on those capitalized assets that are tracking depreciation. So if you've got land, you're probably not tracking depreciation on land because land doesn't depreciate. So, um, so there wouldn't be um, depreciation on those. So as long as it's got a, you know, a method, depreciation method on there, then it's, and it's capitalized, it's going to be included on this report. So again, you have the option of ge generating a summary or detail, looks very similar um, to um, the schedule of change in fixed assets. And like I said, it's only including the capitalized assets. Um, items with blank fund function or asset class will be listed as unclassified, very similar to the other gap reports. Amounts in the unknown fund type sec section um, could be caused by items that don't contain a fund in items or the associated funds fund type is undefined in core. So that's where the unknown. So again, not any different than what we saw in the other ones. The summary report again shows the depreciation changes just like the fixed assets report did. So, but there's just a, one slight thing I wanna make note of in here. Um, let me go to that one. So here's my depreciation and I have it sorted by asset class. And so again, I have my beginning depreciation amounts and this is going and looking at every active item at the beginning of the fiscal year that's tracking depreciation. So it's showing me this is what it was up to the beginning of fiscal year 22. So it's not including fiscal year 22 information yet. So if you know, for those items that um, you know being tracked for the fiscal year 22 depreciation information, that is stored in the continuing items. So this is the fiscal to date depreciation. I wish it would say that instead. <laughs> Beginning depreciation, fiscal to date depreciation, and then you've got all of your change schedule activity. These are the changes that were made. So if I added an item this year um, that I tracked depreciation on that's capitalized, it's gonna show in this column, if I disposed of an asset this year uh, and there was depreciation on it, the depreciation amount will show in here, um, transfers in and out, and then my adjustments. Um, and I'm not gonna go through the whole adjustment thing if that's working with the, the same way as it did with um, the original cost, the 103 amount. So same behavior. It's just that it's showing your depreciation figures. And then we do have the detail report as well on the depreciation. And again, for those changes throughout the year, acquisitions, dispositions, transfers, it's going to provide the tags that make up those depreciation amounts. So auditors will you know, use this um, and compare it to the book value because the book value contains um, depreciation amounts as well. Um, and so obviously the book value is going to include capitalized and non-cap. So they do have to be careful when they're running it, if they're gonna try to compare it to this gap report that they just need to select capitalized or else the two won't match. Um, and so that's, so going into that, leading into the book value, does anyone have any questions about the depreciation report. Are the continuing items based on the month? I don't know for sure. 
here. Based on when you ran it, or it's going, it should, because if you are, you, well, I don't know. I'm not sure. I, I would, I think we would have to like look at a particular item and see what happens and try to test it out. So that's going out there, the continuing items, it's going out there and tracking the fiscal to date. So let's say you added the item um, three years ago, okay? And it should contain the yearly life to date in that field. So you added the item back in January of 2019. So those six months in 2019, 2020, 2021, and let's say I'm in 2022 right now. Um, so I've got, you know, kind of like two and a half years that are showing in the beginning depreciation. And then the current year is showing in the continuing items. That's how I believe, Heidi, that that's being calculated. It's going to show the yearly amount, but that's a good question. And I will confirm that and then I will document it to make sure. Um, but I'm pretty sure that's what it's doing. It's going to be whatever that yearly depreciation is. So the first, the beginning is showing the first two and a half years. And then here's the basically the three and a half year amount is, you know, that part of the, that full year is showing in the continuing items. If they added the item this year um, and tracked depreciation, and it was for January, that six months is going to show in the acquisition column, right? Because it was acquired this year. So that's what that's gonna show there. Well, I hope that helped. But yeah, that's a, I'm gonna make a note of that. Um, I always look through um, the comments after the training because those are saved during the recording. So I'll make sure to make note of that. And and really, um, I thought we had that documented already, but I don't think it's documented as well, just to explain that in more detail. In fact, I'm glad you mentioned that, Heidi, because we are working on a depreciation document in, I know we don't have one, we had one in Classic, um, in Redesign. And so that's something that the, the developers are looking over right now. Um, but we will have like a fiscal to date depreciation section. I'll show you here. That talks about the yearly depreciation and just depreciation in general. So right now you guys, aren't seeing this depreciation option because I've got a lockdown. Um, but this is what we're going to do is we're going to have the fields involved in tracking depreciation. We have the life to, to date depreciation calculation. And what we're trying to tweak is these tables here of showing, and this is where some of this may be removed, but I'm thinking this guy down here we want to give you examples of a tag and how it was depreciated yearly so that you can see, you know, what's going on with that tag when it depreciates. So this is the stuff that um, we're going to, to have out there available for you guys. And I know the auditors, it'll be a great reference tool for them to see how um, these are being calculated. Um, we're, we're trying to mimic, you know, what, what was in classic, obviously. So, um, but we're just making better documentation. Um, so that's basically, you know, what we're working on right now. So like I said, hopefully get that out there soon for you guys. Um, the book value. Um, so like I said, the 104 is the depreciation. I'm sorry. Schedule change and depreciation is the depreciation report. The book value is the other one. And this is including those items that are currently being tracked. 
This may include capitalized or non-cap if they're also tracking depreciation um, for, inven for like inventory for uh, insurance purposes and stuff like that. Um, so this is where I wanna talk about a change that we are fixing here. Um, when you run the book value, it defaults to the current year that's marked. So if I have 22 and 23 open, but 22 is current, it's going to display 22 when I run the book value. Um, I think I have that included in here. So we do have a little issue with the original cost. Um, and uh, yeah, on the currently um, with the original cost. So let me backtrack here. Here's my book value. You'll see that the book value here, are all the items that are being tracked for depreciation, it includes the original cost, the salvage value, the current life to date, the year to date, the percentage that's been depreciated so far, the total, and then the book value amount. And then it also includes the last year of useful life for that item. So there is a lot of information on here. And I know there are some things on here the auditors want added and some things that, I don't know, I don't think anyone said they wanted anything removed yet. Um, but I think like the function code is missing on here. I got asset class and I think we have fun, but I don't think we have function code. So we're trying to find ways to squeeze it in, but as you can see, it's pretty packed already. Um, but just talking about this first before I talk about those bugs, um, in here, the original cost is pulling from obviously the original cost of the asset. So it's looking at that original cost field and populating it in here. If there is a salvage value, um, yeah, I, I think with Gatsby 34 years ago, I thought that that wasn't really required anymore, but I could be wrong. Um, but districts still have savage values on there. Those will be listed on here as well. Um, the life to date, this is looking at the current life to date depreciation on that item. So this is not calculating this on the fly. This is looking at what's being stored on that item right now. Um, and so the year to date is the fiscal to date. That's like that continuing item section on the, the 104 report. Um, that is this area right here. So if this item has been completely depreciated, it's gonna be zero because it's, it's done. It's done depreciating. It still may be an active item, a capitalized asset even, but it's not being depreciated anymore. So no more year-to-date depreciation. Um, Mary asks, can you subtotal the report by the sort options? Soon, very, very soon. Um, that is the biggest question um, is, uh, you know, the sorting and subtotaling features. Um, I'm missing it too, believe me, uh, when you're trying to run it compared to classic. So um, those are gonna be on here. And I think the next release, I'm pretty sure that stuff's going to be out there. Um, and I, you know, Ed asked too, if you're sorting them, you, you're doing the subtotaling too, right? And they're like, yes, Michelle, we're doing the subtotaling too. And I'm like, okay, just making sure. Um, so if I'm sorting by, fu by fund, I want to see it subtotal by fund. Um, <laughs> so everyone's like, yes, finally, I know I get it. Um, but just to talk about this here. So we got life today. And then we have year to date. So this is you know, stored on the life to date. The year to date is being calculated on the fly based on the original cost, the life, the beginning depreciation date, any salvage value to give you your, you know, your current year to date amount. So that gets calculated on the fly. And so life to date plus year to date equals total depreciation. So this is the life plus here, the whole ball of wax. So my book value then is going to be my original cost minus my total depreciation is my book value. What's it worth still? Uh, well, it's completely depreciated. So not worth a whole lot. And also you'll see here too, the last useful life here shows them in here. So just looking at the first several, they've all been fully depreciated. So those all should have been depreciated out. 
Okay, and these are my test files too, so Lord only knows what I've done to them. <laughs> um, so that's how the report works. Now, we do have a known issue on, and it's going to go out on the next release, the 127. It's issue 405. Currently, that original cost column I was showing you, um, if I've got like 22 and 23 open and I've done processing, I've added some items in 23, it's currently, even though I'm selecting 22 as my year, um, when I run the book value, it's pulling all years. So it's pulling that 23 um, acquisitions as well. And so we are making sure that the depreciation values, I believe, are okay, but the original cost is not. So that's going to get fixed on the 127 release. So, um, yeah, I didn't really finish this. I need to tweak that. So fiscal year will be for the current year I'm running the report for. Maybe I just need to add a period there. Um, like today would be the amount of depreciation up through the end of the prior year. So again, looking at that report, my life, I'm in fiscal year 21 or in 22, and I'm sorry, these are going to be fixed as well. The title's up here in the next release. I know that's been confusing for people as well, um, but or maybe those were fixed, um, but the, no, they weren't. Um, the book value um, should be uh, up through the current year. So that should be 22. Um, so my life to date is up through 21. So this life to date amount should not be including any depreciation for 22 yet. That's on my year to date. Um, and then the total depreciation then would be the two of them together. So yes, a lot of cleanup on the book value. Um, titles are going to be right. You know, some of these amounts that are not driving right now are going to be correct. So we'll make sure and get this stuff cleaned up. Okay. Um, I know that I knew I would run over. Um, I'm going to just do the FAQs and then I'm going to reference those other fiscal year end reports, which I just want to mention. Um, I'll, I'll reference where those are at so you guys can read those over later. Um, but I do want to go through some of these FAQs, which will go will be out there on the documentation as well. And I think you have to keep in mind these FAQs are after these bugs are fixed. <laughs> so um, you're going to, you know, if you're like, wait a minute, that's not true. Um, it will be. Um, so this is how we're projecting that, you know, this stuff is going to work once we clean up some of these bugs that are on 127 and 128. Um, so. Just a question answer type of thing here. Um, and these are just scenarios. So I've got 22 and 23 open, but 22 is current. I've entered capitalized information on both years. So I've got items entered in 23. I have not closed 22. So when I run my gap reports, for 22, because that's my current. Will it include the 23 amounts and, you know, additions, dispositions, stuff that I've made, changes that reflect, you know, that change the amounts? Will it include that? Barring this that we're fixing on the 407 issue, no, it, sh it should not. It will only include up through that 22 activity if you're running it for 22. So we do have that known issue on 407 where it's including future year acquisition amounts in the beginning balances of the 22 report, and that's going to be fixed. Um, so right now, though, um, but once that's taken care of, if you're running it for 22, it should show you the, the figures as of 22. I have both 22 and 23 open, but 23 is current. I have entered capitalized assets for both years. I have not closed 22 yet. So when I'm running gap reports using the 2023 date, will the beginning balances and life to date amounts be correct? Because I haven't closed 22. No, they won't be. How can they be? 
you haven't closed 22 yet. So when you close a period, it updates the life to date, adds another year's worth of depreciation, and it also updates the beginning balances for those new items that were added during 22. Um, any changes that were made to capitalized assets during 22. So those aren't updated yet, not until you close the year. So that is something that they have to keep in mind if they're going to leave 22 open. And I've got another FAQ down at the bottom that uh, we'll talk about that as well. Um, question number three, I have closed 22. And 23 is open. And I process transactions in 23. But I still have 22 current. When I'm looking at an item that I added in 22, there's a beginning balance field on, on there. Why? I'm I'm not, I'm still got 22 current. It it can't remove those. When you closed 22. <clears throat> that new item's beginning balance was set. Um, it, and I'm in, you know, I've got 23 open. I'm going to see that regardless whatever my current year is. Now, when I'm running reports for 22, it shouldn't take that into consideration um, as part of my beginning balance because I'm running a report for 22. That's one of the things that's getting fixed. But um, it's not going to remove that based on my current year. I switch current years, doesn't matter. I closed 22, that beginning balance was set on that item for 23 and it's gonna stay there. So I've had that question. So that's why I wanted to make sure. I have both 22 and 23 open and 23 is current. Do I have to make 22 current in order to post transactions? This has happened. I've had a few tickets on this and I want this to clarify this is that it doesn't work any differently than it does in USAS. If you have two periods open, you can process in both. Um, doesn't matter what the current period, current month, is, you know, current period is. And with, you, with inventory, it's a little bit easier, a little more forgiving because it's just years are your periods. So if you have 22 and 23 open, uh, 23 is current, you do not have to switch it, make 22 current in order to enter an item for 22. As long as the period is open, you can process against it. My next one, I have both 22 and 23 open and 23 is current. So they're open, 23 is current, and I run a book value for 2023. Will having fiscal year 22 open affect anything? That kind of goes back to my question, you know, a couple questions ago there. It will if you haven't closed 22. So if you haven't closed 22, it will affect the life to date amounts because those have not been updated to include the life to date from fiscal year 22. So you have to close it in order to get an accurate life to date for 23. Um, if I have both 22 and 23 open and fiscal year 22 is current, if I run a book value for 22, we'll have, that should have been another question, sorry. Will having fiscal year 23 open affect anything? And that's where we do have that little snafu with that one JIRA issue. So I'm gonna clean this one up a little bit. I meant to uh, update that a little bit, so sorry about that. Um, so I think that the gist of all of this question is, you know, if you leave a year open, the prior year open and you're running reports like gap reports or a book value report in the new year, your amounts may not be correct when it comes to depreciation and those beginning balances on the gap reports because those get set when you close a year. So they just have to keep that in mind. Um, question six, I migrated in 22. 
can I generate a book value from 2019? No, it can't calculate archived periods. And I found out yesterday too, um, and I did put something out there in the documentation that right now <coughs> users have the ability to add archived periods through the core fiscal years, and that shouldn't happen. Um, so I notified the developers about that yesterday um, that we need to um, get that fixed. Um, at this point, I don't know if it's affecting anything, but um, you know they're going in and and you know they migrated over in 22, and they're going in and adding um, prior year periods to try and fix things, and that's not going to help anything. So um, just want to make sure that they when they migrate, you know they can't go in and create periods from archived years. So and also, you know these type of reports. You know, at this point, you know, if it's archived data, it's really hard to get that report, you know, um, from one of those archived years. So we don't trust that things would be correct. So uh, they need to use their EISCD reports to get that information. Um, number seven is the one that I struggle with, um, and I'm sure some of you guys do too. Um, but uh, wanting to keep 22 open for the auditors, but want to start processing for 23, can I? You can, and you can open 23, but, um, you know, running any 23 reports that, you know, gap reports aren't going to be correct, just like I just explained a few minutes ago. Um, but why leave it open? I understood in classic they did because once you close a period, you can't go back. Right. Um, when you ran EIS closing classic, you were done. You know, you'd have to restore the data back to the prior year in order to make changes. But in redesign, you can. You can reopen a period. So um, they can reopen 22 and make any changes based on your audit. Obviously, if it's going to affect gap reports because it's capitalized or affect anything, you know, that you were running for 22 for your fiscal year and report bundle that's going to get affected if you're going in and making, you know, significant changes, but your the auditors are requesting this. It's, you know, the district is good with it. And then it generates a whole new set of fiscal year and reports when they reclose it. So um, I, I think my biggest concern is, is if they leave 22 open and it's now February and they haven't been audited yet, and you're running the risk of, you know, creating these reports, um, generating gap reports that are not correct because you haven't closed 22 in order to get your life to date depreciation amounts, you know, up to date. And in order to get, you know, your beginning balances for those items that you added in 22, those aren't out there yet. So some of those reports aren't going to be correct. Uh, 304, uh, a brief asset listing will um because that can include everything but you know my concern and our concern is you know things not being accurate because you've held that period open for so long so that's you know something to keep in mind if they're wanting to leave their year open why you can close it and reopen it um make the changes per audit and close it again so the last one um, <clears throat> is if I reopen 22, enter some capitalized assets, and I reclose 22, what happens to the life to date and beginning balance figures once I close? So obviously, for those, if you did reopen and those new capitalized assets, obviously, once you close, those beginning balances will be set. So the new year, 23. Uh, will include those figures in, in their beginning balances. Um, if you, you know, went in and reopened 22 and did not make change to, you know, a capitalized asset, you know, that you added in 21, um, and you go and reclose 22, the life to date should not change. Now, I know we've got a ticket out there from somebody's 
that's concerned that theirs are. So we're looking into that. I don't, I haven't had a chance to look at it yet to see, um, but um, it's, you know, confirming that with the developer <clears throat> the other day, those should not change. Um, they should only change on those items that you added or made changes to uh, when you reopened that year. You know, you reclose it, those are going to change. But any existing ones, it's not going to add another year's worth of depreciation onto that. It shouldn't. So, um, but obviously, if you, you know, have seen some issues or something like that, or the district's reporting that, you need to create a ticket and we'll look into it. But um, I'm not aware of anything right now other than that one ticket that came in. So, okay. Um, those are, I wanted to stop right there. I didn't want to give you guys too many of these, but I'm going to document these FAQs. Um, I just feel like it's, you know, probably helpful for them just to have scenarios. Probably won't include all of these, but I'll get a little synopsis of this and uh, summarize them and, and put them out there for you guys. Um, the one other thing I was talking about with the reports, and I, like I said, I was just gonna mention is, um, you know, we covered the gap reports, we covered the book, va book value. The audit report is another one that we are making some, some improvements on. Um, I think one of the biggest takeaways on that one right now that I'm aware of is <clears throat> um, tags. So, and I found this just because I was looking for stuff, um, is if I enter a specific tag, I shouldn't have to put in a start and ending date. I just want everything about that tag from beginning of time. So I think they're going to um, update that. So if you have a specific tag, you have the option, you don't have to put in a start and stop date for that. Other than that, I mean, to me, this has been very useful in looking for things. I think the biggest takeaway I have with this is the auditors are coming in and saying, um, you know, they're, you know, when I look at their reports from when they migrated, the life today, this is one specific instance, the life today, it was fully, you know, depreciated. Well, now that life today is showing that it's only 10% depreciated on the item. What did, you know, the migration do? It didn't do anything. Um, I ran an audits report and found that the district made act probably inadvertently um, did a spreadsheet import and they had life to date figures in there, but they were changing um, locations and it overwrote their existing life to date with these new ones and totally updating them. It's no different than the way it worked in classic. So classic did the same thing. It doesn't, the import can't know that, oh, you don't want to do life today. You know, you have to remove that column if you don't want to overwrite the data. So once I clarify that, they're like, okay. So, you know, that makes sense, right? Because they went in and changed it. Then they got to <clears throat> change it again, either by doing a new spreadsheet or using the depreciate option to recalculate it back to where it was. I mean, I can't blame the auditors. They're going in saying, hey, you know, at the end, you know, they migrated their total depreciation for last year was 21,000. And now their life to date for the new year is showing 15 or 21 million and their new one's showing 15 million. Why is it 6 million left? That's because this audit report helped me out to see what happened to life to date. So what I did, <clears throat> is I ran a you know a demand report and I put in the date range from when um, the district um, started and I went into the report type and this is the best part is that I can narrow this down and put in a particular option like the item record. My life to date figures are on the item record. So that's going to narrow it down big time. So I want to select that. I can select more than one. And then I can, you know, even enter in a specific user if I know who that is. And then I can sort it by date is how I did it. And then when I generated the report, mind you, the report was 12,000 pages. 
But what happened is I did a search like you would with any PDF file on the life to date field. Bingo. I found exactly, you know, they gave me like a tags examples. I could have run the report for just that tag and probably figured it out as well. Um, so that was helpful. Um, but um, I was able to see that, yeah, they totally overrode it and they probably did it by accident, not realizing. So that's, you know, one thing that we have already documented in the documentation when they're doing imports um, and, you know, it's um, not a new item, it's updating existing items. They want to be very, very careful that they only include the columns for the fields that they want to update. So if I'm updating location codes, I want the inventory tag and the location code, and that's it. I don't want any other columns on that spreadsheet uh, because it will overwrite it. So, um, so that's you know just a, a good example of how to use the audit report. Um, there, the difference between the demand and the official is the official does um, provide a signature block at the end. So if the district wants to run the audit report for an official to sign off on it for whatever said time frame, um, they can and then sign that report. In the audit report, can you put multiple tags separated by commas? You should. That's I believe that's why that's um, long. Um, so you should be able to put in commas in between those and just get those specific tag numbers. Are there any plans to add an Excel reports option to reports? Yes, yes, yes. That's a good question. Believe me, I miss it too. Um, you know, that was one thing we talked about with the focus group um, is providing those options. And it wasn't something that they were concerned about at that point. Um, so we did not implement them at that time. Um, but I know that um, it's it would be very nice to have, especially when you're talking about some reports that have quite a bit of information on them. Uh, just be able to see that in a spreadsheet format would be nice. I don't know the JIRA issue off the top of my head, but we definitely have one for that. So um, to create, to be able to generate those CSV files. I don't even think it's, a, I'm not sure if it's a feedback issue or not, um, but yeah, that's something we definitely wanna add. sure I didn't miss anything. Okay. Well, I know that was a lot of information, but I hope that um, it helped. And like I said, I will place that document out there too um, after I tweak it some more. So I'll be doing that um, and get that out to you guys next week. And I'll probably put that out there for now. Underneath, here's our training and registration page. I'll probably link it in here right now underneath the supporting materials, but eventually we'll be adding some of that stuff um, into the documentation. Um, next mm, Friday, we've got the October recap. And then I wanted just to make note here that our calendar year in review will be on a Thursday this year and not on a Friday. Um, I think last year we did that too. Um, so our calendar year end for um, USAS and payroll, inventory doesn't have one, so we won't be worried about that, is going to be on November 10th, that Thursday. And uh, just to make note, that'll be a longer um, session as well. So, um, and we will have all the supporting documentation links and stuff available at that time too. And then here's just a list of some of the other stuff. We're going to keep you guys entertained up through the end of the year here. Um, and we're gonna start looking into next year's as well. And obviously, if you guys want specific training on things, when you fill out the evaluations um, that you receive from these training sessions, please mark those down. Uh, that really helps us to schedule out our sessions for the new year. So thanks everybody. And if you guys don't have any further questions, have a wonderful weekend, everybody enjoy it.